Okay, so uh, this morning we are still looking at the book of Hebrews, and uh, we are coming to the end of our series. So basically we are concluding what we've been looking at, uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, the entire month. And uh, I, I believe at, at the moment we, 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 we can read the book of Hebrews from a point of understanding. So far what we have covered, I believe that all of us, we can uh, go through that book from a point of understanding and it's Hebrews in itself for me, I, I just love the book, the, the way it brings out the, the message, especially concerning Jesus Christ. And uh, for the last three Sundays, we have been going through a few sections of, of the book and uh, seeing how uh, Christ is portrayed as the most superior uh, as compared to anything that we can ever think of, and uh, this 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 uh, this Sunday, I'm doing the conclusion of of the book, and uh, you realize that we have not like co gone through the entire uh, book verse to verse. Uh, that is not be, uh, literally possible on a Sunday service. That one needs uh, a class somewhere. We sit and we look at it, and uh, I'm sure it can take us uh, several weeks to finish that book. But in the book of Hebrews, we have seen uh, that Christ is superior. He is superior to the angels, Moses, the, uh, the priesthood of Aaron, and he even gives us a better covenant that is much superior than uh, the, the old uh, covenant. And uh, we also tried to understand the people, the first recipients of this letter to the Hebrews, the, the people who, who were addressed the letter to, and we saw why the letter was written the way it was written to them. And uh, in Hebrews, Christ is portrayed as superior in everything. Uh, it, just in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we, we read, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom we, he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, uh, or the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So Christ is literally over everything, and he's superior to everything that we can, we can ever imagine of. And the book keeps on comparing Christ with the entire, especially religious system of the Jews, uh, whom the book was addressed to. In uh, chapter 1, verse 4, we find Christ is being compared to the angels. And the Bible says, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to, the, to theirs. So he's superior to the angels. Then we are told he's superior to Moses in chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house is greater than the house itself. Then we, in chapter 7, we are shown that he's superior to the priesthood of Aaron. In 7.23, the Bible says, now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. So the other priests couldn't be there because at some point they had to die. But Christ 
is there forever and his priesthood is permanent. In chapter 9, we are shown uh, that the covenant that Christ gave us is much superior than the old covenant. Uh, 9 verse, uh, verse 11, the Bible says, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. We know that the old tab tabernacle used to be carried along, but the one that Christ did for us is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus ob obtaining eternal redemption. And so that's, that's Christ. That's Christ to us. He is better than the angels. So somebody will not tell you that let's pray to the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priesthood that was uh, there with Aaron. He's better than the covenant that he's giving us is much better than the old covenant. And that's Christ. So today we are looking at the conclusion of the book, and that's chapter 13 of uh, Hebrews. But before we look at that chapter, I'd like us to quickly skim through chapters 11 and 12. Chapters 11 and 12 of that book. And the reason I want us to do that because uh, those two chapters are loaded with things that I think when we just read in our normal reading, we, we, we pass over them. So I just want us to skim through it, then we will look at, at uh, chapter 13. Now, chapters 11 and 12 The author is making an exhortation to the recipients of the letter not to lose their faith in Christ. After he has done all the comparison of Christ with their entire religious system, in chapters 11 and 12 is an exhortation, is a plea to them that don't lose your faith in Christ. Don't lose it. That's what he's doing in chapters 11 and 12. And he starts off chapter 11 with uh, our famous definition of faith. And he says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So he tells us what is faith. What he wants us not to lose, he tells us, that it is an assurance, the confidence of what we hope for. I like how the NLT puts verse 1. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is evidence of the things we cannot see. And as he says, he says, this is what the ancients the people of the past were commended for. And later on, he leads some of the people uh, that were commended for that faith. And in fact, he leads so many people until towards the end, he says, space cannot allow us. And he gives us the list of those people and Adam, Abraham, Meshach, and he gives the list, and I think that list is covered in the entire book or in the entire chapter. These are the men and women that James says in James 5.17 that they were just like us. They were just like us, but the difference was they had faith. And James says Elijah was just a man. He was not an angel. And he prayed. But in the same chapter, we are given a warning for, of lacking faith in God. In Hebrews eleven six, the Bible says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, we cannot. We have to believe in him. And I think faith is so important to us, as believers. And even when you look at Christ himself, on several occasions, he, he kept on insisting, telling his disciples, you have faith in God. Faith. Faith is the evidence of the things that we hope for. Yes, I'm trusting God for something, but I already have an evidence. The evidence that I have is the faith in God that I'm praying. And Christ, in the story of a, a, a demon-possessed son in Matthew 17, we find Christ insisting and telling his disciples, you need faith for some things. In verse 14, he says, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and, he suffer and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Because you have so little faith. And I think this explains us so well. We have so little faith. And I think we need to make the prayer of this man in Mark. He said, Lord, help my unbelief. That's what he prayed. And Christ says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If you have faith. Yes, what we have is little, but we, if we can increase it to the size of a mustard seed, then we can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And he says, nothing will be impossible to us. In the story of a cast fig tree, in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, this after uh, disciples are seeing that the tree has dried up, and they asked him, and he responds, and he says in verse 22, Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that, that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's Christ speaking. That's Christ speaking to us. So faith, that's all we need. Trusting in God and fully trusting in God. In chapter 12, chapter 12, so after explaining the faith and giving an example of the great men and women of faith, 
chapter 12 is an encouragement, an exhortation that, yes, we need to have faith in God and let's keep at it. And chapter 12 seems to bring the impression that, yes, it will not be easy, but let's hold on to Christ. And this is how chapter 12 begins. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the cloud of witnesses are the men and women that he has been mentioning in verse chapter 11. Because these men and women are an evidence that faith works, they can show, we can look unto them and indeed faith. We can look unto Elijah that he prayed, the Lord let it not rain for three and a half years and it did not rain. And again he prayed, Lord let it rain, then it rained. So we can look at him and say, yes, this Elijah prayed and it worked. I can also pray and it can work. So the cloud of witnesses are the men and women in chapter 11 that he's talking about in chapter 12. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You realize we, 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 we carry some, some burdens that we shouldn't be carrying and they affect our faith in God. And so he's telling us, throw them away. Throw them away. And that sin that easily entangles. That sin that easily puts us away from the presence of God. That sin that easily makes us not walk right with God. Just let, throw it off. That's what he's saying. And let us run with perseverance the rest marked out for us. It will have challenges, but let us run it with perseverance. Fixing our eyes, this is where we get our theme of the year. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Some versions say the author and finisher of our faith the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Yes, the rest will have challenges, but let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And we do it in faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary. Consider Christ. Consider Christ. And you will not grow weary. Then he again continues to talk about perseverance as we, we walk the race or as we run the race that has been marked out for us. In verse 4 he says, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And I think this is true. Any one of us who has struggled against him until shedding blood, any one of us? I think none. This is true. In our struggle against sin, we have not struggled to the point of shedding. And so he says in verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. In most cases, our struggle against sin, to us it appears as if it's hardship. But it's discipline. If you are not disciplined, he says in verse 8, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. Not true sons and daughters at all. And verse 12, he says, 
Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. It's not going to be easy. But as long as we are focused on Christ, let us run the race that is marked out for us. He again gives a warning and encouragement for holiness in verse 14 of the same chapter. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And verse 12, an encouragement. And I, I like how Hebrews puts it. It's a, a corporate responsibility as a church. It's all of us. He says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows to cause trouble and defile many. See to it. We have to see to it, all of us, that none of us fall short of the grace of God. Then he, in verse 22, Two, after some earlier verses, after making a comparison of Mount Sinai, where Moses received the commandments, and Mount Zion, where Christ was, and Mount, Mount, Mount Sinai, we know Christ, uh, God told Moses to, like, to secure the mountain. No one could go near. Somebody who even an animal, if it strayed and went close to the mountain, it was supposed to be stoned to death. And so he says, Mount Sinai was representing fear. But Zion, where Christ is, is a mountain that represents the presence of the Lord. And so he tells us, let us go to Christ. And verse 22, he says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel that's where we have gone to Christ focus on Jesus then he finishes off that chapter, uh, verse 28. He says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. At times, it might look as if it's hopeless. But remember, the kingdom that we have received, it cannot be shaken. At times, the church might look as if it's being swallowed up and consumed in the world. But you, you have to remember that the church of Christ, actually, for over 2,000, 2000 years, it has been going through an attack by the enemy. It has. All we need to do as believers is to truly focus on Christ. We have to remember the words of Christ in Matthew uh, 16 verse 18. It says, and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of heads will not overcome it. It will not overcome the church of Christ. Let's just focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. That's all we need to do. 
So that's basically what is covered in chapters 11 and uh, 12 of Hebrews, 12 and Hebrews. And uh, finally, we look at chapter 13, that was uh, read to us by Joel. And uh, chapter 13 marks as the closing remarks of the author of the book of Hebrews. In, uh, in this chapter, he's giving his final uh, exhortation, his final remarks to, to, to his res recipients. And basically what he's doing in chapter 13, he's asking them to, up, to, to apply the faith in their daily living. That's what he's doing in chapter 13. It is an application of the faith that he has kept on telling them, let us focus on Christ. He's much better. Let us keep, preserve our faith. And so in chapter 13, he's telling them, can we now live out that faith in Christ? That's what he's doing in, the, in his final remarks. And the author chooses a few issues in, I believe they are not exhaustive, but maybe those are the issues that he, he picked from the people that he was writing to. And so he chooses to address them in telling them how they are supposed to live their faith in God. And I think when you look at the chapter, you, 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 you see he's talking about so, so many things, heavy but just mentioning them and moving, mentioning them and moving, so many things. And I think this can be used to help us as believers today so that we can live our lives that are focused on Christ and live righteous lives before our God. And he starts off chapter 13, verse 1. He says, keep on love, loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. You realize those three verses are carrying literally three topics in them. Love one another. That's something that ought to be a Christian character. Love. Just love. And I think Christ said that when he was asked the greatest commandment to him was love. Paul says, says it in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says the greatest of this, these three remain, but the greatest is love. Love one another. Love one another. And he talks about hospitality, something that we rarely do today. As, unfortunately, even us as believers. Hospitality. Showing hospitality. Showing hospitality. And this should characterize every Christian home that we are willing to welcome other people and reach out to them and just welcome and have time with, just have a cup of tea with them. And just talk to them. At times, people don't, don't require much. They just want to see that, oh, they can be accepted. That's all people need. That they are valued as human beings. Just show hospitality. Open your door to somebody. Even to a stranger. As he says, some have entertained angels. Some have entertained angels. And I think when he was writing that, he was having Abraham in mind. Some have entertained the angels. Remember those in prison. Remember those in prison. And those who are mistreated. And I think we can look around and see so many people who are mistreated. Last week, somebody just walked in the office. Uh, he's an Asian, and uh, he 
he has been in prison for the last one year. I think he's been out for the last two months. And uh, he, he went to the prison as a Hindu. He came out as a Christian. And the reason why he, he came out as a Christian, there were some SDA people who used to go and preach to him. And he's now a Christian. And Christ keeps on telling us about these things. And I think at times we miss on God just by not doing the basics of what Christ told us. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 25, 34 to 40. Christ says this. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did, you, did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you see you a stranger and invite you in, needing clothes and clothe you? When did, you, did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the, of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That's, that's Christ speaking. How many times have we missed on God? By just uh, giving a cloth to somebody. Just getting a meal for someone. How many times have we missed on God? How many times? So many. May God help us. At times God comes to us. He, he knocks on our doors. But we rarely recognize his voice. He passes before our eyes. But we let him pass. May God help us that we see him. Verse 4 of Hebrews 13, he talks about marriage. And he says, marriage should be honored by all. The marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Uh, some, some, some versions say, and the fornicate. I think the NIV wants to make it inclusive. And friends, I can tell you from, from a personal observation, I'm a pastor, I can tell you for sure. If there's somewhere the devil is fighting Christians, if there's somewhere, a place where the devil is after Christians, is marriage and sexual, sexual and marriage and sexuality. That's where we have a problem in the church today. And we, we need to pray and reach out to one another and speak where it needs to be spoken. I think this week or last week, we've seen what the Supreme Court did. Yeah. Their line of thought means you can allow anything. We need to speak. That can tell you marriages are suffering. And people are silently. They are, they are crying. They are crying. We need to pray and reach out to one another. We need to reach out to our young people. Our young people are living as if they are married and they are not married. And it's true. We need to. And for, for the older couples here, just, just, just pick one young couple and walk with them. 
and just, just pour out your life experience of marriage, of family, of child raising, of communicating, of handling finances in your marriages so that we can help our young people who are married to stand. To stand. We need to, to do something about this. And we need to look out as a child. We need to, to speak out as a church. Uh, in verses 5 to 6, he, he talks about the story of contentment and money. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I'll not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? We are living in a materialistic world where we have pressure to acquire and acquire and acquire and acquire. That's what we are doing today. But for us as believers, we are told to be content with the little that we have. Timothy says uh, in First Timothy chapter 6, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into the temptation and are trapped and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And this is happening today. Contentment. Then he, verse 7, he talks about honoring uh, spiritual leaders. He says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Uh, I don't want to dwell on it because I'll seem as if I'm blowing my own trumpet. Uh, but it's a command from the Lord that we've been given and we need to obey it. The, the work that we do is not one of the easiest uh, uh, work that you, you want to do. At times you, you think about it and you wonder, God, can I just be a good Christian and just be sitting in the pews and just coming to church on Sunday and then go home? You think about it, at times you think of a way out and at times, actually, uh, chances come along your way that can you, you can use them to get out of this. And some of them, actually, they, they seem enticing, especially financially. And you, then you ask God, and you, the, the answer, I don't want you there, I still want you here. Then you, you remain. It's, it's not one of the easiest things. Uh, to do uh, but God gives us the grace to sustain us so that we, we are here every day uh, I think the, the, this is where we have so many high expectations we are not expected to make mistakes uh, a funny one, we, we are not expected to cry in funeral. When people are crying, the pastor, you have to be composed and encourage the people. Uh, but we, we also cry. We also make mistakes. And I realized, by the way, if you want, main, you want to make many mistakes in life, just become a leader. Today, everything that Ruto speaks, 
we find a mistake in it, sindio? It's new kweli. It's happening. Why? Because he's a leader. Everything that he speaks, we will find a mistake in it. And I can tell you it happens here. But God sustains us through. Uh, pray, always pray for us. And uh, pray, and especially pray for our spouses. Uh, they, they are the ones who carry us. When we, when, we, when we also cry, they are the ones who, who carry us. Uh, pray for them. Paul says this in First Thessalonians. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Have oh, this uh, Hebrews 17, he says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no benefit to you. So it's a command we are given to the Lord. But I also uh, caution us that we don't take it to the extreme. And I think we have seen uh, the other side of it, uh, where uh, some of us uh, who are in these positions have taken uh, advantage of it and uh, it has uh, brought uh, a bad report uh, on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, let's obey what the Lord is telling us. Then he talks about false teachings in verses 9 and 10. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. And I think this is common today. Strange doctrines are taking away believers. Uh, I remember, uh, I think, three years ago, I met... Uh, I met a brother that we we were with in a CU in campus in town here. Uh, it was after a long time then I met him. Then I was, hey, long time. Eh, eh. Here in Eldoret? Yes, yes. Where do you fellowship? Then he looked at me. He kept quiet. Then he told me I fellowship with a, a special uh, group of believers. He was a very strong brother in the sea. Yes, he he was fellowshipping with a, a group that we call Brahmites. And I think you can go and look out. It's a cult. Yeah, but a very good brother. You are with him. It takes people away from the truth. Second Timothy 4, 3 to 4, he says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So, they are out there, but hold to what is true. That will save you. Then, uh, he draws our attention again to Christ in verses 11 to 16. This after making a comparison of what the, uh, the priest used to do in the Old Testament. He's telling us what to do in verse 11. He says, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the, dis the, the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city. We are looking for the, for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, 
let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruits of lips that openly profess his name. Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So he's telling us how we are to offer our sacrifices to God. Praise and doing good to one another. Then uh, he requests for prayers as he closes his remarks. In verse 18, he says, Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. In particular, I urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. And I think this is some of the verses that the, those who claim Pauline authorship uh, claim uh, by that statement, restored to you soon. Then he makes his final benediction to uh, his, uh, in verses 20 to 25. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every, everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact, I have written to you quite uh, briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come to, with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. That's how the book ends. And so, today as believers, if we focused on Christ who is the author and perfecter of our faith. If we showed love to one another as he asks us, hospitality and sympathy to those who are suffering. If we strived to live at peace with one another, honored our leaders and lived a life of purity and chastity, honoring our marriages, lived a life of contentment in all situations and offered our sacrifices of praise to our God. I believe that we will have a better life. Our lives will change for good. And we will be in the presence of the Lord enjoying uh, Him every day. And this is the kind that the Lord desires that we, as his children, live. And how I pray that we all hear his voice and just chose to put away everything that hinders, every sin that easily entangles, and chose to focus on Christ our Lord. May God help us. Let's start. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Now, church, if you are in our midst, there's something that you feel for real, it hinders you. There's that sin that you, you know it entangles you. That you struggle with it. And today you want to let it go. And today you want just to throw it away that God will set you free. You can just put up your hand wherever you are and we will pray and trust that God will put that thing off, will release you from that sin. Yes, it could be secret, but the Lord knows it. So just put up your hand and we'll trust God together. Thank you for those hands. 
and we'll pray that God will set us free. Lord, you promise to set us free. You promise to deliver us. You promise to cleanse us, Lord. And this morning, Lord, as a sign of surrender, hands are lifted up before you. Praying the Lord Jesus, you help us. On our own, Lord, we cannot do it. We need you to help us. That that sin that, Lord, entangles us, that sin that puts us away from your presence, Lord, that thing that hinders us, Lord, from enjoying, from running the race that you've set before us, Lord, we pray the Lord, you set us free today. And these dear ones, Lord, are surrendering and asking of you that Jesus, you may break that bondage, that those chains that are holding them, Lord. King of kings, may you set them free. Do we ask of you, Lord, that this morning, Lord, you are helping us Lord, to live lives that bring glory to you, that show that we are called by your name, that show that, Lord Jesus, we are focused on you, O oh God. And more so, Lord Jesus, we are praying for our marriages, Lord. We call upon your name, Jesus. The Lord, our marriages will bring glory to your name that we will seek to honor you in our marriages, in our families, Lord. Oh, God. We pray for our young people, King of Kings, that they will live pure lives, oh, God. Lives in purity, Lord. Jesus, help us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Thank you for your word. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we desire that this year as a church, we will focus on you. Because you are the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And if we focus on you, Jesus, we know the Lord we will run the rest marked out for us until the end. We will persevere through trials, through temptations, because we know that we have you, King of Kings. And so, Lord, we adore you and we bless your name. Thank you this morning. We pray the Lord, you watch over us, protect us, Lord. Lord, even as we go into the week ahead of us, we pray for more grace. Thank you, Lord. Bless us, bless our families, Lord. Bless our jobs, bless our businesses, bless our farms. We continue to trust you, Lord, for the rains as a country. We continue to pray for our leaders, Lord. We continue to pray that, Lord, you revive our economy again, Lord. We ask of you that, Jesus, you bless us. We thank you. We give glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now may the grace... Love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you.